Good morning. Uh, my name is James, and I uh, just want to encourage you with a couple things. One, uh, our youth group has brought 26 guests in the last two weeks. Can we give them a big hand? They're, they're next door, and they got a lot of guests, and I love that David uh, asked Andrew to preach over there today, and he said, Andrew, make sure that you uh, invite people to respond to the gospel. So we want to pray for those guests to come to Christ today. Uh, secondly, um, you know, last week we kicked off uh, our neighborhood market, and we shared a little bit last week, but just want to let you know, again, just we're praising God. We have it open again here in the next week or so, and last week we were able to serve and feed 140 people when you count out all the people we were able to feed, and so we're just praising God for this church taking these steps to reach the needs in our community, and so uh, before we pray, I just want to say, hey, let us dive into this word today because this word can be challenging for some of us and so let's prepare our hearts god we love you and we thank you for the opportunity to worship you today to seek you today and god i just pray that as your word challenges us today that we will respond like the people of god should respond in jesus name amen you know i have a few moments in my life where i'm like man i wish i could go back to that moment and have that moment over again. Do, do any of you have that moment where you're like, oh, I wish I had a mulligan on that moment in my life. And if I had a time travel machine, uh, I would go back to that moment and I would do something so different. You know, I have one of those big moments was uh, when I was a young youth pastor and, and I was in Reynosa, Mexico leading a mission trip and it was our day off, and so our pockets were full of money. And we were walking into uh, the uh, market there, and we were crossing the American side of the border. And as we were walking across, I noticed that the, fen the bridge that we were going to walk across had a fence that went over the whole bridge. And I thought, oh, that must be to keep people from falling over into this dry bed underneath. And as I started walking across, I quickly realized that the fence was not to protect those who were walking across the bridge, but it was to protect those who were on the bridge from those who were under the bridge. And there wasn't really any adults under the bridge, but there was kids, a whole bunch of kids. And the kids had these long sticks. And on these sticks, they had uh, either Clorox bottle or a gallon of milk empty bottle. And they opened up the top of it so that they could smack the fence as you walked all the way across and you know just basically want you to drop money into those buckets and as I was walking across I, I had never seen anything like that and when I first saw it and they were smacking and I looked at these little kids my heart almost just stopped and I thought oh my gosh this is this is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life and I could hardly take it I even thought to myself that if there was ever an image on earth that could even come close to what hell might look like. This is what it is. And, and, and in that stunned moment, what I didn't do was I didn't instruct my group, who every single one of them had their uh, pockets full of money. I didn't instruct us to, you know, feed these kids a lunch or even to go down and love them. And by the way, did you know our whole mission trip was to go down there and love on people? But when we saw this, here's what I did. I couldn't stand to look at it. So I put my head down and I just walked across the rest of the bridge. And what I didn't realize that I had done, when I got to the other side of the bridge, I looked back and the hundred students that were walking behind me followed and did exactly what I did. I taught them to put their heads down. I taught them not to look at pain. I taught them to just pass on by. And that's one of those moments that God has dealt with me in some serious ways. And I'll share more about that here in a little bit. But it's one of those moments that I just wish I could have that moment back. And when we come to our text today, there's a man who probably wishes that he could have this one moment back in his life. He asked Jesus a question. And Jesus volleyed the answer, or volleyed the question, excuse me, back to the man. And the man took the question... 
And then he answered it correctly. But once he answered the question correctly, he then asked another question that would make him look really good in front of everybody. And it's at this moment how Jesus answered that question. Man, the way Jesus answered that question, I can guarantee you because how it's recorded 2,000 years later, that man wishes he could have that moment back. He probably wishes he never asked that question. So let's look at our text today. As we look at uh, Luke chapter 10, it says, On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, a, a lawyer stands up in the midst of a group. Now, you've got to understand about a lawyer back then. They knew the Old Testament law. They were the ones who people looked to. They were religious. They were experts. They were scholars. So he asked Jesus this, what we would call a pretty simple Question. Now, here's the thing. The Greek word test, to test Jesus, it's not what it looks like on the surface. It wasn't like he was just hoping Jesus would get it right. No, he was intentionally hoping to catch Jesus in a theological trap and embarrass him. So Jesus, having this lawyer who's trying to trap him, uh, takes up another notch and he uses the Socratic method and he responds to a question by asking him a question. So let's look at this next part. It says, um, what is written on the law? Jesus replied, and how do you read it? So he turns the question back on the man. Now here's what the funny part is. You gotta see that there's humor here. A, a devout Jew during that time, especially a scribe, a lawyer, would have been wearing a phylactery on their forehead and another phylactery on their arm. A phylactery would be a leather uh, little box that has scripture in it. So you can imagine Jesus, when the guy asked him, you know, what must I do to inter inherit eternal life? You can imagine Jesus pointing at what's written on his head, almost like, well, what do you think it says here? And I wish the Bible says, would say that Jesus uh, flicked him on the phylactery and said, what do you think it says that? But you know, I don't get to write the Bible, but this guy's literally wearing the answer. It would be like, I'm wearing a t-shirt that has a famous rock and roll band on it. And then I ask you, what's your favorite band? And then you would respond, what is the band that you're wearing on your shirt? The guy asked Jesus, how must I inherit eternal life? And Jesus is like, well, man, you got it written on your forehead. So what do you think it says? So you see this very humorous interchange between these two. And so the, the young scribe, he answered, well, number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus responded, hey, you, you got it, buddy. You answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, here's what you got to understand. The guy answered correctly and he broke it down into two simple answers. He broke it down to love the Lord your God with everything you have and love your neighbor. Now, to understand what was going on here, he answered the first part, love the Lord your God with everything you got. And that was a prayer that they would say every day, twice a day, called the Shema. The Shema covered the first four commandments which was talking about our relationship with God. So the first four commandments of the 10 commandments is all about our relationship with God. But then the second part, the last six commandments, that's talking about how we interact with our neighbors. So by answering love the Lord your God, he covered the first four commandments. Love your neighbor, he covered the last 10 commandments. So by this man's answer, love God and love others, he covered the whole 10 commandments. This is a very wise, a very much educated uh, scholar. And so he answers the question correctly. So this is where the story changes. You ready? Here's where the story changes. But he wanted to justify himself. I'm going to interpret this myself. He wanted to prove his intelligence. He wanted to show off. He wanted to get admiration. Uh, he was having a prideful moment. So he wanted to justify himself, and he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And so we see here the expert uh, has the same problem that most experts in this world have. They can become extremely proud of themselves. And therefore, he asked Jesus to define neighbor, but he's not asking Jesus to define neighbor just so everybody in, you know, in the crowd will get some education, but he's wanting to prove that he's a good neighbor. And what you see here in this text is pride. 
And pride is something that's so, so easily well up in us just for doing a little bit of good. You know, pride is something that I constantly have to pray all the time for God to not allow in my life. And, and I'm the type of person that I could become prideful over anything. Yesterday, my wife asked me to um, fix a cabinet in our kitchen. It required me going out and getting a drill, opening that drawer and going, Mrrr, and I did it. <laughs> and I closed the door, opened it up two or three times, put it down, I thought, what would she do without me? And I was so proud of myself. I was. I mean, pride could just well up in us so quickly over anything. I um, was invited along with the rest of our staff to go over to Pastor Isaac's house. Pastor Isaac is the pastor who leads the Arabic congregation at our church. And we went over to his home. The whole staff was there in his house. Absolutely beautiful house. And we get to the living room. And in the living room is a collage of pictures of Pastor Isaac throughout the years of ministry. So I look at my wife and I'm like, they got a collage of pictures of him in their living room. There's not a picture of me anywhere in our house. If, if you were to go through our first level and upstairs, the only evidence that I live at my house is there's a deer mount. <laughs> Other than that, there's no evidence that I exist, okay? And, and so I'm like, that's how. You respect a man, baby. She's, oh, okay, okay. Well, later that evening, we're sitting out back, and, and uh, Pastor Isaac asked me, hey, James, when are you going to go to Egypt? And so I was joking around with him, like, oh, that sounds horrible. That's so hot. Egypt's so hot, man. Look at me. I'll die. And he's like, well, there's other seasons. And I, and he, and I said, also, I went online, and there's, there's all this uh, you know, hunting opportunities, but there's not one thing that I would like to hunt for. You guys don't have great hunting there. And then he says, well, you can hunt for snakes. And I said, I hate snakes. I'm scared to death of snakes. Oh, Lord, no. And then one of his sons says, Dad, tell him about when you fought the cobra. And I'm like, you fought a cobra? And so here's how it works. In Egypt, if you don't finish high school, you're conscripted to the army for three years. You finish high school two years. You finish college one year. Isaac was serving his one year in the military. He's out in the desert on patrol. He's walking along. He hears this big snake coming up behind him. He turns around. It's reared up at him, ready to strike. And so I said, did you shoot it? He goes, no, you're not allowed to pull your weapon without your commander's, uh, you know, uh, giving you the permission to do that. I go, what did you do? He says, I grabbed a metal stick. I said, what did you do then? He goes, I fought it. And then he just talked about it like it was nothing. He goes, well, first of all, you don't want to go behind a cobra. You don't want to go to the side of a cobra. When you fight a cobra, you want to go head on. And then the soft part, part of the top of their head, that's a soft part. That's what you want to aim at. And then he proceeded to tell me that he beat that cobra to death. And I am sitting there going like, you got to be kidding me. And then his kids go, tell him about the barracks. About a month later, another cobra got into the barracks. And so the army guys said, Isaac, you know how to kill uh, cobras. We go kill the cobra. So Isaac grabs a metal bar, goes into a barrack, and he takes on another cobra. And he kills it. And then... I'm sitting there, my jaw is to the floor, and I'm like, this is, you are amazing. I'm blown away by this guy. And then I said something like, this is the equivalent to like, in America, one of us killing a bear with a knife. I mean, this is amazing. And in that moment, my wife leans over to me and said, this is why he has a collage. <laughs> Yeah, my wife knows how to humble me sometimes. <laughs> and it's good for us to have people who love us and humble us. And what we're going to see through the rest of the story is Jesus loves the people he's talking to. But there's some humbling. And the humbling is hoping to bring change. Because when we're humble, the only way we change is when we humble ourselves. There's no such thing as change without humility. So Lord is trying to humble through this story. So Jesus tells a story. He says in reply, Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And here's what we're going to see. And here's how we're going to do the rest of this message. What we're going to do is we're going to look at three different types of people in this world. 
First of all, we come across the first group, and these are the people who like to beat up on others. Now, traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, this man would have gone through the thing called a passive adumim. A passive adumim is translated into the Hebrew, it means blood. And so it became known as the way of blood. Up until the 5th century, Jerome even called it the bloody way. And up until the 19th century, uh, local sheiks would charge you to walk you through this just so you were safe. Because basically you had nothing but desert. Then you had several miles of nothing but huge mountains on both sides with a lot of caves. And it was very easy for people to hide in the caves and come out and attack you. And so uh, some people, the commentators over the years throughout history will even say, you know what, this traveler knew better. He knew better than to walk through this area by himself. He, he knew better. He heard the stories. He shouldn't have been going there by himself. This is what he deserves for, for, you know, not thinking it through. And that's how someone who beats up on others responds to those in need. In every town, city, country in the world today, there are people who beat up on others. There are people who make themselves feel good at the cost of others. There are people who bully others into doing what they want them to do. Uh, these are the people who wear suits and then take advantage of the poor. These are the poor who take advantage of the kind-hearted. These are the takers of the world. These are the people who at home, in their home, it's their way or the highway. These are the people who at work, that you work with, uh, use other people to their advantage. In the church, in the church, it's those people who have their own agenda without thinking about anybody else because it's all about them and their agenda. Now, here's a very, very silly, silly little story to help you get that point. Uh, it was after I was here for a little while, not too long. We were having a big party out back after church to have her stick. And it was a very hot day. And I had finished doing stuff up here, greeting people, and I walked out to this parking lot facing Haverstick, and then I was walking over through the parking lot that faces 465. And I had a long sleeve shirt on, and now this is right after the period where I decided to stop wearing suits and, 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 and coats. And I'm just gonna dress like a normal human being. And so I'm walking, and it is hot. It is hot. I'm already dripping with sweat. And then I see this elderly lady. It's she and I are the only ones in this parking lot because the whole party's over there. And she's really struggling with a walker and she can't get into her car. And so I run over to her. Did I tell you it was hot? <laughs> so I run over to her and I'm like, hey, it looks like you're really struggling. Let me help you out. And I literally helped her like physically get to her car seat, buckled her up said, what's your injury? Talk to her. I'm so sorry you're hurting. And, and it was her first time, you know, trying to figure out how to do life like this. And I put her um, walker in the back seat and I closed up and I said, man, I really hope you get to feeling better pretty soon. You have a blessed day. And then she looked at me, she said, pastor, I really wish you would dress better. <laughs> she did not say thank you. She just simply said, I really wish you would dress better. The only thing that would have been better in that story is she'd have pulled out and ran over both of my toes. <laughs> that would have been great. A much better story. But instead, she just walked away. And, and to be honest, I tell you that story because it's a really, really, really silly story. But that really represents an overall attitude that can happen very easily in a church. People can get their expectations of what they want from everyone else, what they want from the church. And it's all about their expectations. You know what? If I was a guest that day and I wasn't the pastor, I would have done the same thing. I would have helped anybody like that. And if she'd have said something to me about the clothes I was wearing, you think I would have ever brought my family back to this church? There's no way. There's no way. And let me tell you something. I tell that story only because I feel like I'm not seeing any of that for a long, long time. And a matter of fact, the way you love people, I am extremely proud to be your pastor. But I wanted to tell you that little silly story because let me tell you, to be 100% honest, as I walked over to the crowd, I felt a little beat up. Like I'm not good enough to be her pastor. I'm good enough to be a pastor here at this church. And I felt beat up. See, people who have their own agenda, they will beat up other people. For instance, the guys who were hiding out in the cave who attacked this man, they felt like it was okay beat him up to do whatever they wanted to him physically, emotionally, or mentally, and, and, and they stole from him. Why? Because they felt like it was their right. If they want to beat somebody down, they could beat somebody down because there are those in the world who believe 
it's okay to beat others down. The second group we see that Jesus talks about are those who pass up others in need. Those who pass up others in need. Let's look at this. A priest happened to be going down the same road and he saw the man and he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. Now this is the group I believe wholeheartedly breaks Jesus' heart. The priest and the Levite, these are people considered close to God. They're representatives of God. They represent the church people. They represent the pastors. This is the group that would represent the church. And they just passed on by. Jesus picks out two men who are considered men of religion. And they just passed on by. Whenever I read this story, I can't help but to think about a story that I read a long time ago, which I'm sure a lot of you are readers in this church. You've ran across this story before. So the young man recounting his days in Nazi Germany during a Holocaust. And he said, I lived in Germany during a Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian. I attended church since I was a small boy. We had heard the stories of what was happening to the Jews, but we tried to distance ourselves from the reality of what was taking place. What could we do to stop it anyways? And they said the railroad track ran behind our small church and each Sunday morning, we would hear the whistle from a distance and the clacking of the wheels over the track. And we became disturbed when one Sunday we noticed that there was cries coming out of the train as it passed by. And we grimly realized that they were carrying Jews like cattle in those cars. And week after week, the train whistle would come and we would dread to hear the sound of the old wheels and we knew that the Jews would start crying out as they passed the church. He said it was incredibly disturbing. And so he said, our church decided that when the train came by and the people started screaming, that's when we would start our worship set. And then the louder they screamed, the louder we would sing until we could hear them no more. You talk about wishing somebody could go back and having another moment. I wonder what the priest or Levi distracted themselves with when they passed by the man who was beaten. Did they pass, did they distract themselves with thoughts of like, well, if I touch him, I'm unclean and I can't go do my duties at the temple. Or you know what, maybe this is a scene. They want us to go help him and then there's gonna be other robbers who are gonna come out and attack him. I wonder what they distracted themselves with in order to justify passing on by. But here's the thing, the text doesn't give a motive. It's not concerned with a reason. The reason doesn't matter to Jesus. The point is that someone who knew what to do didn't do what they were supposed to do. Instead, they just pass on by. And then let's read the rest of the story. But a Samaritan, now the story changes. As he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. Brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper. He said, look after him. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now we come to the third type of humans. Those who lift up others. See, the only problem with how Jesus ends the story is who he makes the hero. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They didn't just kind of not like them, they really hated them. They made jokes about them, they talked bad about them, they ignored them in public. Uh, The Samaritans, you need to live in your neighborhoods. Jews will live in our neighborhoods. And there was no love lost between these ethnic groups. So where did this source of hatred come from? Can you pull up the map? The source of hatred came from about 922 BC. If you see here in the kingdom of Israel during that time, Samaria was actually the capital of of Israel, very important city. But when the Assyrians came over and attacked, they carried away all the people of the Northern Kingdom. They left a few people behind, a few people from Samaria behind. Well, in 2 Kings chapter 17, it talks about how those Samaritans who were left behind, they started to intermarry with people from outside of their ethnic group. And so they start marrying anybody they can find outside of their ethnic group. And so by the time the Jews came back from captivity to rebuild Israel, they considered the Samaritans a mixed race. And so therefore they would have nothing to do with them. And then this, this, this went on for years, even to the point where the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim was destroyed. So think about this. By the time Jesus tells a story, it answers the question, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? By the time Jesus answers this story, it's been so Seven centuries, 700 years of hating each other. Now, Jesus didn't do this on accident. Jesus had a 
a purpose for naming the Samaritan a hero. Let me give you those two purposes. Number one, he makes it clear that in God's kingdom, there is no such thing as non-neighbor. All right, do you hear that? In God's kingdom, there's no such thing as a non-neighbor. If you are a part of the kingdom of God, there is no such thing as a non-neighbor to you. It doesn't matter if they're black, they're white, doesn't matter what ethnicity you come from, doesn't matter if they are a Jew, doesn't matter if they're Egyptian, doesn't matter if they're uh, Latino, it doesn't matter if they're from Canada, it doesn't matter. I didn't even mean for that to be funny, I'm sorry. But <laughs> I was just thinking of other areas. It doesn't matter. There's no such thing as a non-neighbor. Number two. He challenges his listeners to relook about the way they think about ethnic groups. So we're supposed to emulate the Samaritans. What's three things the Samaritans do? Now, how do we emulate? Number one, he has compassion. His heart's broken for this person. So, but he doesn't just stay at compassion because a lot of us can stay at compassion. When I walked across the bridge, I had compassion. Okay? We can have compassion. But we must move to the next step, and that is he got his hands dirty. And those who are in the kingdom get their hands dirty. They do something about it. And I love that he uses his own resources. He didn't make an excuse. Did you notice that um, he did not actually have all the resources that he needed to take care of him? He said, here's a deposit. I'll be back and I'll bring some more to cover this. In other words, he was going to figure out how to take care of that person. So sometimes we'll use excuses. We don't have what it takes. But if we are really caring for someone, we'll figure it out. We will figure it out. Now, here's Jesus tells a story which kind of blows everybody's mind. They did not want to hear the story like this. They're not happy about how the story is told. And then Jesus closes it like this. He asks another question. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? The expert of the law, again, nails it. By the way, this guy's right every single time. He says, the one who had mercy on him. Good answer, huh? Perfect score, 100%. But did you notice something? In this text, do you notice that there's something really big left out here? Pay attention to this. Who was the one who, you know, was the neighbor in the story? He says, the one who had mercy on him. The expert of the law still could not say Samaritan. His hatred for that culture was so deep that he still could not say the Samaritan. That's big. That's really big. And so Jesus takes this, and what he does is he, he doesn't let this just become a story that goes down in history, a, 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 a beautiful story, a moment where he uh, outduels the, uh, uh, you know, the scholar. No, Jesus ends the story by saying this, go and do likewise. There's a call to all of us to go and do likewise. See, let me just break down a few things. As we think about our church, as we think about not trying to be a bigger church, but, but doing everything we can to be a better church, what does our church look like in the future? There's a few things we could grab from this story, okay? Here is the field that we're going to play in, okay? Number one, okay, we are not to ask who our neighbor is. We are to just be a neighbor, okay? We don't ask who our neighbor is. We're just to be a neighbor. Number two. Love that comes from the heart responds with the hands. We're not a church that is just going to be full of tears and compassion, but we're going to be people who do something about things. See, knowledge of God, we can go to all the Sunday school classes, all the small groups, and we can do all the Bible studies on this earth. But if you become a scholar and yet you don't know how to be the hands and feet of Christ, we've missed something big time here. It's not the point. It's not the point. Now, how do we apply this text to our congregation today? Number one, I think Jesus wanted us to do three things. One, is we help others even when they brought trouble on themselves. Here's what I've heard over the years from many, many Christians over the years. Well, if they'd have done this, they wouldn't be in this situation. Or if they'd have done this or that or this or that, or because they made these decisions or blah, 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 blah. We're so focused on how somebody screwed things up in the past that we make that as an excuse so we can't help them today. Uh, I don't think so. No, that, we are not going to be those people. When someone has a need, we try to meet that need. See, even the scholars throughout the years said, hey, he knew better than to go down that way. Jesus wasn't, didn't care if that was the point. He just says, let's help 
those who are in need. Even if their backstory isn't something we're excited about. Number two, anyone who is in need, that's our neighbor. And number three, our response must be practical and not simply consist of feeling sorry. So as I close up today, I just wanna share a few things. One, I wanna go back to my original story and say God dealt with me for a long time about that. And out of that, I decided, you know, I'm definitely, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna be a different type of pastor. I'm not gonna be a pastor who preaches all the time about what we should do and doesn't, and, and doesn't live it out. And so, the first change I made was when our hometown had a homeless ministry opportunity, I was one of the first pastors to say, I want to help. And so for the next many years, I would live with the homeless for three to six weeks. I taught our church how to interact with the homeless and to the point where uh, actually some of the homeless people became a part of our church ministry and got saved. Number two, I said to our youth, group, we will no longer go on mission trips and just be like tourists who do good. Whatever we learn on the mission trip, we will come back home and implement it. And so on our first mission trip after that, we learned how to run a VBS to a project community. So when we came back, every summer from that point on, on Wednesday nights, we would go to a local project and we would run a VBS. We would have all the teachers out there, the kids were leading all the classes, or our students were leading all the classes. We had a barbecue, we had have games, and we led a lot of kids to Christ. And then the next year on our mission trip, we learned how to throw these big block parties. And so we would throw these big block parties where we, uh, we would come back to our hometown and we would go around and invite, you know, these kids to these block parties where every single one of them would be told about Jesus. And we would present the gospel to every single one of them through a bracelet. And, and here's the thing. We didn't ex- know whether to expect 100 or 200. And every single one of those we did, we'd had four to 800 kids show up for these. It was overwhelming. And our, just our youth group would put this on. And some of the neighborhoods I went to, I had to get gang members respond, uh, permission to go knock on the doors. In some of the neighborhoods, the gang members would walk me door to door because even the pastors and the gang members agreed, we need to love kids. Now, I don't see that playing out here. When I was away last year on my um, vacation, Lord really started to speak to me. And one of the things that God really started to ask me this question, started delving deep into my soul. And this question kept coming over and over again. What if Church of the Cross would not have opened back up after the pandemic? What would happen? And the first thing I thought is there's a lot of people who's been here for many years that would be heartbroken because they lost their friends, they lost their church, and they invested in it. Okay, but then I felt like God kept prodding me, but what would the community think? I'm like, well, there's, there's this one ministry here, this one little ministry. They'd be really sad if we didn't have the ECC in our community. But to be honest... I could not say of integrity that our community would be heartbroken if Church of the Crossing would have shut down. And I feel like that's the purpose that God's spoken to my soul is for us to become the type of church that if we were to shut down tomorrow, that the communities around us would have to go to their civic leaders and say, what are you gonna do to replace the works that they were doing? For us to become a church that if something were to happen, it would rock our community. That's the type of church we are going to become. We're going to become a type of church that when we see a need, when we get a leader and the resources, we're going to meet that need. It's going to take a while. But this is the direction we're going. We've already started. Hey, we got a, we already opened up our, our neighborhood pantry. Hey, we got a legal clinic going on. We're helping those girls who decide to keep their baby. We're going to be discipling them and, and throwing parties for them and loving on them. And, and, and we're taking one step at a time. But ultimately, what we're going to do is we're going to be a church that decides we're not going to just pass by our community but we're going to be the hands and feet of Christ in our community and so my question to you is we've been talking Andrew and I keep talking about having dirty hands around here and really what that's talking about is not being somebody who's a what I would say uh, a, a Christian who just gobbles up the Bible And we become like these turkeys and we get all fat (laughs) because we just gobbled up, gobbled up, gobbled up, but we've never went out and done anything. I want us to be a church that gets our hands dirty and loves this community, loves on our kids, loves on our youth. I want to give us some time to pray right now. And I want you to just talk to God. And again, it's one of those things where we take step by step and we just want, and, and part of it is just consecrating ourselves to the Lord and saying, Lord, these hands belong to you. My body belongs to you. My life belongs to you. 
I will not pass people by. So can we just take some time to pray right now? I want you to have a conversation with the Lord. And just here in silence, with our heads bowed, I want you to consecrate yourself again to say, God, whatever you call me to do, whatever you need me to do, my hands belong to you. Let's pray. Jesus, there's some of us who, in order to be the hands and feet of Christ in this area, we need to get connected to a group. So help us to take that step. Maybe that's our first step today. For some of us, it's, it's not about that we don't have the heart to do it. It's just we're, we're shy. We get anxious. God, help us to um, empower us to over, help us to overcome those fears. For some of us, our schedule is so crazy that we don't have time to do that. God, show us how to do this in the midst of our crazy schedule. Help us to see our workplace as our mission. Help us to see our child's ball team as our mission field. God, we want to be the hands and feet of Christ. We want to carry this message through the week. We pray this now in the name of Jesus. Amen.